I don't believe in moonshots. We did that, by the way. And they're wonderful things. They motivate us. But what I need to find are dark clouds. Now, what's the difference? Well, a moonshot is something that we think we can do, but it's going to be tough. And it's going to take a lot of work. We knew when Kennedy said, we're going to go to the moon, he said, yeah, we're going to go there. I can envision a rocket. It'll get bigger, and I can kind of visualize it. But what about the stuff that we don't know about? Our big holes in our knowledge. That's what I want to know about, and that's what I look for. Now, where did the term dark clouds come from? Fortunately, I've got this guy. Poor guy, he is stuck with the concept of the dark cloud, and everybody says, no, he didn't say it. This is Lord Kelvin. Now, let me first of all tell you that Lord Kelvin is a super smart guy. Very, very smart. How smart is he? The first transatlantic cable became possible after many failures because of him. What else did he do? Oh, the second law of thermodynamics. He came up with it. Pretty smart. He had 70 patented inventions. He wrote 661 papers. The first paper he wrote was when he was 16. Smart guy. Now, let me tell you something. Lord Kelvin has been stuck with a very bad thing, dark clouds, because he said to the British Academy of the Advancement of Science in 1900, he said, there is nothing new to be learned in physics. There's only more and more precise measurements. And he went on a little bit more beyond that, and he said, as a matter of fact, there are only two dark clouds left on the horizon. Now, Lord Kelvin could call his dark clouds. Let me talk about somebody else. Albert Einstein, Al. This is something you guys probably don't know about Al because we revere him. He is a rock star in our eyes. He changed our vision of this world. This is a letter he wrote to his buddy, Conrad Habisch, in 1905, five years after uh, Lord Kelvin made his proclamation of two dark clouds. I gotta tell you something about Al. Al did not speak until he was two. He was called kindly, the uh, awkward one by his family, or almost backward, and the uh, nanny just called him the dopey one. So that gives you some kind of idea. At age 14, he was thrown out of class for being insolent. At, uh, he went on, and because of that, his father went to the headmaster and said, what can this boy do? And the headmaster said, I don't care what he does, he's not gonna be successful at anything. Uh, so put, put him over there with Lord Kelvin for miscalling things. And so he wrote this letter. Uh, well, oh, let me tell you, he got into college after he flunked his test, his entrance exam the first time. That's not Al that we know. And then he also flunked a physics class, by the way, while he was in there. Well, I'll give him a break. He didn't go to one of the classes because it did not interest him. Instead, he studied physics with his buddies. One of his buddies, he's writing a letter now. They called it the Olympia Academy. It was four guys that just got together. Went and had beers, go to the coffee houses, and let's talk about physics because they're not teaching us what we want. He is yelling at his buddy Conrad and saying, Conrad, you're a professor now and you wrote a paper, you didn't send it to me. I've been waiting two years to finally get a job out of college because they wouldn't make me an assistant so I could be a doctor. I'm not a doctor, I can't teach. Send me your stuff, I'm bored. I am a third class patent clerk and I'm bored. And I'll tell you what, you send me your one paper, I'm gonna send you four papers. This is a deal, four papers. And he goes on to describe them. Well, of course, long story short, the first paper got him the Nobel Prize. Not bad. Second one, after you know, writing this brilliant paper, the uh, Zurich Polytechnic said, well, geez, we better give him a doctorate. So the second paper they used for his doctorate. It's actually the most cited for 50 years. That's, they changed the way we mix concrete, believe it or not. Thank you, Al. Third one had to do with Brownian motion, uh, almost won him the Nobel Prize, but they said, let's go with the first one instead. And the fourth one was special relativity. He writes a postcard after, you know, bruising through this for about three months to write four papers, poor guy, uh, that revolutionized all of physics. And he goes, I'm drunk under the table with my wife. Oh, thanks for your paper, Conrad. And guess what? I got another paper. It has to do with L e, or excuse me, M equals L over V squared, but we'll get that straight later. And so he, he put out a three-page paper. He changed it around to be more uh, in line with the notation of the time. It's E equals MC squared. So you, if you've heard of that equation. This guy should have fallen through the cracks. 
This guy should never have graduated from any college you've heard of. And yet, where would we be right now if it wasn't for him? Wow, we almost missed out. And the worst thing, when he started writing those papers, you know what he wanted to do? He did not want to be the world famous rock star physicist that he was. He wanted to be promoted from third class patent clerk to second class patent clerk. <laughs> okay. There was another guy, that was called his Anus Mirabilis, his miracle year. Somebody else had one, so I said, well, let me match up these two. They're almost identical. The good thing about being a patent clerk is if you hurry up and do your patent work, you've got almost all day to work on your physics. The same thing happened to Isaac Newton. A wonderful thing happened for Isaac and us. Bad thing happened for England, of course. Uh, they had a black plague. Uh, and they said, okay, school's closed for two years. Go home, Isaac. And he did. And then he started working on, he had a little book that said questions. Questions I want answered before I die. I want to know this stuff. The first one was gravity. So he looks at it and says, I got to solve the problem of gravity. We don't know how gravity works or how to model it. He starts working and goes, I can't solve this, so I need calculus. So I'll invent calculus. <laughs> he invents calculus. He had a couple of weeks. He knocks it out. Ah, <laughs> gravity is solved. He had a theory of optics. Beautiful. And he came up with the three laws of motion that we know today. Not bad. Okay. He should have fallen through the cracks. So that made me think a little bit. A little crazy idea. How many guys are falling through the cracks, guys and girls, excuse me, falling through the cracks now, today? Well, I don't know, but think about it. If we have, with our birth rate, better nutrition, 3,000 Einsteins and Newtons are falling th through the cracks, or I should say being born genetically every day. So I go, where are they? I don't know. Are we teaching them wrong? Maybe. But are there really any problems that we need solving? Well, first of all, we know that there's 10,000 uh, Earth-crossing objects. They're called NEOs, uh, near-Earth objects. They're almost 100 times more than that that we don't know. I don't know if you know what those are. We call them, at NASA, as a technical term, we call them killer asteroids. Makes it easier. <laughs> but we don't know where they are. There's a problem. That would be a nice one to solve. If you don't think it's a big problem, ask the dinosaurs. They think it's a big deal. <laughs> they wish their space program was a little bit better. <laughs> what else have we got? I look up in the sky, and I see galaxies, galaxies. And I go, our understanding of gravity says they shouldn't exist. So we have to make up stuff. We call it dark matter. Why is it dark? because we don't know what it is. We can't sense it, we have no clue. There's a nice little hole that we might want to fill in. Then we look and we go at these same galaxies and we go, wait a minute, the galaxies are moving away, but you know, they should be attracting each other with gravity because they're big things, but they're accelerating apart. They're accelerating? So we have to come up with something that's in the middle of those galaxies and we call it dark energy. What is that? We can't measure that either. So let me tell you something, you look up in the sky you know, especially if you go to the desert, that beautiful night sky, and you see all of those beautiful stars. The sky is filled with them. Sextillion is the real number. They say there's more than that up there, okay? What you're looking at in that beautiful sky is less than 4% of what we think exists. Where's the other 96%? We don't know. That's a nice little hole to fill in. <laughs> These things can hurt you. So I don't have a moonshot for you. I've got a what if. What if I get every child on this planet that's born and I protect them, I feed them, I clothe them, I shelter them, and I start teaching them. And I don't teach them what to think, I teach them how to think. I don't care if you learn about physics, I don't care if you learn about biology, I don't care if you do art, learn. That's wonderful. What would happen to all of these dark clouds that we're finding. I don't know about you, but that's the kind of future I would like to live in. Thank you.